I'll share some of that. So um, thank you for inviting me to uh, UDEC. Um, yeah. One of the nice things about this place is that whatever happens, uh, according to the rules, happens for a good reason. And uh, I thought there'd be plenty of time for me to put my talk together and to get some slides together, some notes and stuff. But we've been so busy with workshops and activities, uh, eating beers that um, <laughs> It's, it's going to be a little bit rough on the edges here, so please bear with me, it's going to be a little choppy, but um, we'll see what we can do. You know, I grew up in the 1980s, and uh, as a nerdy kid, one of my favorite movies was The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. Does anybody know what that one? <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a film by W.D. Richter, and the, the writing is amazing. It's kind of weird, and I still haven't quite figured out the movie. But uh, I like that one of the, the workshops that unfortunately I had missed because it's elsewhere, uh, but was titled The Future of UDEC. I mean, really, what is the future of UDEC? Where are we going? And a lot of people are asking, so where are we going? What are we doing? What is the future of things? And I can't help but pull my favorite quote from the movie, which is, no matter where you go, there you are. <laughs> and I really can't argue with that. It's, it's about as honest an assessment as things get. And in my work, I'm very much uh, an education futurist. Really, I focus on the future of work, the future of education, and what it really takes to, to take for us to get from point A to point B. And what you're really finding out, though, is that it is really centered around you, or us. Um, it seems that the world is becoming a bit more scary for people, a more chaotic, or a bit more uh, ambiguous. Uh, we can't continue to do the same old stuff the same old ways copy what others have done before us. So it's up to each of us to find who we are and build our futures from there. And I think that within the democratic education community, this is one of the key strengths. It's one of the key strengths of this group. So, and this is also one of the key ideas we present book, uh, No Man's Society, which uh, Crystal uh, shared and their copies for sale from uh, via Campania. Um, and I'll explain what nomads are in a couple minutes. Okay, so it's, Portmanteau kind of put together. But I've been inspired by many of the creative individuals who helped shape the world that we live in. You know, these are people like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Woody Allen. Uh, but what I was really curious about is how they were able to plunk out of formal education, or Woody Allen's case, he was kicked out of school. And that really, you know, drive much of what we have in society today and be so successful. So in the Nomad Society Project, we looked at uh, the work in the education landscape and we're to you know, put pieces together to create more of a picture of the whole of what's going on. And we found there's some very curious implications as we move from an industrial society uh, to us really focus our individual capacities to innovate. So I'll give a, just a quick uh, history lesson. And I've been pointing this stuff into this ugly framework called Society 1.0 to Society 3.0. I don't have better language for it, so if you have better language, I'll start using it. But for the time being, it just kind of communicates well. But the 1.0 world is really, you know, agricultural industrial society where we have job, wage, salary-based enterprises. Um, and it's like even before then, uh, you know, kids and adults learn to work together. But industrialization split them apart because we needed adults to show up every day at the same factory. So we put kids in different factories, which we call schools. Everybody lined up in rows, facing the front, uh, downloading uh, you know, information that they need to work at their factory jobs. And somebody at the head of the classroom, like me here, uh, the absolute knowledge and authorities will still upon the state to tell you what's right, what's wrong. Otherwise, you have no chance of being successful. Uh, so put kids in schools, but kids still found ways to, to work um, within the economy, but wasn't uh, very much on peerage. Uh, put kids in rather low-level uh, uh, jobs, uh, ser serving as a chattel in a way. Uh, they still found ways to, con uh, to connect at ec different economic levels. But this also carried over into the, dust into the information economy, which is about taking data, interpreting it, creating information. And we tried the best that we could to hierarchically organize the world around us, organize data, organize our offices, and we have very solid jobs and roles, right? Charles, I knew exactly what you do, and 
you know, it's very well defined, and it's very different from what you're doing, very different from what you're doing, and we do that to avoid chaos and ambiguity at all costs. We call it organizational efficiency. Um, and in this sense, you know, the idea of a career, this is actually a definition from the Random House Dictionary. The word career is uh, derived from 16th century variant of carrier, as in it's something that carries you throughout life. So this, this definition is an occupation or profession, especially requiring uh, special training, all as one's life's work, right? So your job was your work. And your job was also defined for you. So if your grandfather was a baker, your father was a baker, you're expected to become a baker. And your last name is probably Bacher, <laughs> right? Coopers, Smith, Snyder, Turner, I think that's Dreyer in Dutch. I mean, this is just how things were. And so we model our education system to prepare us for this stuff, for these pre-designed work, pre-designed careers, and really our educational systems as a whole are designed to bring us for industrial era jobs. It's finished packaged brains, you know, ready to operate industrial machinery, take orders as, as uh, dictated to us, or stamp government documents as bureaucrats. And I'm also a graduate of the system, so I'd be lying to you if I said it didn't have any value. Um, I really enjoy the sense of license a PhD gives me. Um, I just think that we could do a whole lot better. So, the world's changing, and we seem to be this sort of this 2.0 phase here, uh, which a lot of people have been calling knowledge society. And knowledge is a very interesting thing. Knowledge is when we take information and we interpret it. We interpret it personally, right? And we create personally constructed meanings that have both tacit and explicit elements. And so explicit knowledge is kind of stuff you can, you can read out a book like this, and you can gain some knowledge. Tacit knowledge, you have to learn by doing. Like riding the bicycle. So, I, you know, Chris and I could write a, an 86 volume uh, book on how to ride a bicycle. You can study it, you can pass exams, but you're still not going to know how to ride a bicycle. You just have to go learn by doing. We combine these two forms of knowledge together, we have personal knowledge. This makes us very unique as individuals. In the workforce, this is what makes us competitive in the workforce. It's not about what we learn so much in school, but it's your personal knowledge you bring in. We're also social animals. We get together at, at meetings like this, and we socially construct meaning as well. And the whole, the, the whole attempts to really manage chaos and ambiguity are really starting to fail. Right? We've seen a uh, knowledge management field emerge in the 80s and 1990s, but kind of disappear because it's really hard to manage what's inside of people's heads. So the idea of a career is something that's really changing. This is actually the second definition from the dictionary. A person's progress or general course of action through life or through a phase of life, as in some profession or undertaking. So bottom line is now that we have many jobs and that we float among many different careers in this age. And I think that much of this 2.0 world is really reflected in our cut and paste culture, which includes things like uh, hip hop, Wikipedia, and other media and ideas where we cut and paste new ideas together to create new meaning. And so people are tapping to the imaginations of others and building their dreams upon that. And it sounds like a lot of noise to a lot of people, but I think a lot of big ideas and images are emerging. Um, you know, one company even made a fortune by pitching us the idea to think differently. So technologies, I think, are really helping us open us up. Uh, today's little blogs, wikis, Facebook, YouTube, mobile communications. Anybody can participate as a journalist, or as a scientist, or even as a teacher. Right? We can participate in new ways. But our thinking really needs to turn to action. And so the 3.0 Nomad Society is really about innovation. And more specifically, it's centered on personal innovation. So I like this quote from William Gibson. He says, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. So by that, he's saying that most of us are operating the past of this end of here. And most, most of us, most of our schools, we see bits and pieces of the future here and there, which we're able to you know, kind of get a glimpse as to what's really happening in the world. So this is my take, OK? There are three, there are three pressures in society right now. We have accelerating technological and social change. We have continuing globalization and innovation society fueled by nomads. And I promise to define that uh, real soon. So 
We talk about knowledge society, but the big question that people are running into is, okay, so you have this knowledge, so what? What are you going to do with it? And so this nomadic society is really about how you, can text, how you can textually apply your knowledge to solve new problems. That's called innovation, right? Applying what you know. Knowledge, it turns out, is something that's very horizontally diffused. Whereas before, we tried very, very, very much to organize ourselves by jobs, or even hierarchically. But what you know is way different from what I know, and it's really hard to organize this stuff. And it's now becoming horizontally diffused. These hierarchies that we've had just don't make as much sense anymore. Relationships are becoming, we say, it's heterarchical. And you know, talk about chaos and ambiguity. So we find that the most successful people are really embracing it and intending to create chaos and ambiguity within organizations rather than trying to fight it. So we're looking at we're looking at change where fundamental relationships are moving from simple to complex and creative relationships. I like to use the word teleological to reflect that the system itself is so complex that it's generating its own goals. By the way, you guys look at my vacation pictures here, so this is, this is how I share stuff. Um, conceptualization of order, of course, is no longer as hierarchy as it was, rather much more intentional, self-organizing. We don't have mechanical relationships with each other as much anymore, rather we're seeking out synergies we're asked to design our world, design our careers, design our jobs, design our fa families, design our communities, rather than having them predetermined for us. Our worldview, I mean, a causality, I think, is to, be, is to be very linear. By that, like 20 years, I was a paper boy, I delivered newspapers door to door, so I read the headlines, it's very easy to tell what was going on. A cause B cause C cause D. Very simple. But now change is happening so fast, we say that's a bit anti-causal. By that, we have no idea what, what's causing what. It's like D is causing A, which is causing N, which is causing W, which is also causing A. It's just hard to tell what's going on. So we need to engage in much more creative destruction than slow assembly, assembly style change. And of course, reality is much more contextual than having it been predetermined for us. And it's a much more globalized society than we've ever experienced, which is one of the reasons I'm here. So if you remember uh, pre-industrial nomads, I hear a donkey in the background. It's perfect for this talk. It really is. You'll see why. Uh, if you remember pre-industrial nomads, these are people that, that move around from place to place, oftentimes engaged in agricultural work or trade work. Um, but industrial society forces these people to settle, and often quite brutally. Uh, but now we're seeing new knowledge-based nomads emerging, which like to spell Kian O W M A D S. So it's kind of like Peter Drucker's knowledge worker, but also being very nomadic, 21st century like. And nomads are, are projected to comprise about 45% of the workforce by 2020. This is a huge shift. So we're moving around quite nomadically. And just as what I think we've especially discovered. Uh, recently that uh, companies are no longer loyal to individuals. At the same time, individuals are starting to break away from companies. Uh, we can't expect to work for a single employer for our lives, and nor do many of us want to. We're becoming very nomadic in the work that we take on. 